Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome everyone um, online in front of your screen. Welcome everyone here at TPN in Kassel. We're very glad to have for our today's topic talk Maria Sol, Dr. Maria Sol Pepa from the University of Padua, a postdoc researcher at the Department of History, Geography, and the Ancient World. And she is working there um, on a project on contested wetlands in Sahelian drylands, which kind of development and for whom. And she just recently got her PhD from the University of Padua on the basis of fieldwork in Tanzania in collaboration with the Tanzania Agricultural Research, Agricultural Research Institute, Kitakawa. And her was entitled China Africa Agricultural Relations, Old Narratives and Alternatives. And in today's talk, she's going to provide a glimpse of what she's been doing there. Marisol, welcome, and we're very glad to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can I? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's really glad, and so it's really nice to see people in person and we can discuss with you. And I, before I start the talk, I would really thank the GPN for us in the last weeks and to provide this space to share and confirm today. So thank you. And um, so as I am say, I'm uh, currently a postdoc at Padua University. Uh, however, what I will discuss today and share is some of the observations and some of the starting point of a future research that I consider uh, doing my PhD. However, before I start with the talk, I think it's important to reflect on also how my position has been shaping my research process. And obviously, I'm a white woman growing up in Italy, and I only attended the Western University, and I think uh, much of, of my perception at the beginning has been also based on my on the Western curriculum and that I've been learned from. And I've been training both, both for my bachelor and master in international development cooperation, but on North-South cooperation. And I have a certain view of what, how development should work. And obviously, I, I intend a research rather than a product as a process. And this process has been of self presentivity in the last year. Many of my beliefs have been challenged. I changed my idea about many things. And all of this obviously cannot be happen without all the encounters that happened in the last years. And I had the opportunity to, to live in China and to exchange with Chinese academics to, to with civil society organization as a visiting at the Center for African Studies at Beijing University. And then I had the opportunity to exchange in, at Helsinki at the Global Development Department. And then in Tanzania, I was supported by the Tanzanian Agriculture Research Institute. And so there have been a lot of connection, and without that, all of those reflection and consideration today will not be possible. And on this, I have another uh, point to make that I will not go deeply today about how this has been. Uh, also an emotional process, and emotion has been a big part of my research process. So I will just point out at the really beginning that I was supposed to live in Tanzania for at least one year and then move to South Africa. Uh, but by the time I had been my research permit, it has been really a long process. It took, it took over a year because sometimes uh, University were resisting about accepting my topic because it was dealing with Chinese involvement in, in the country. And at the end, I obtained my research permits and I moved to Tanzania and I stayed there in early months because then there was the outbreak of COVID 19 and I had to come back. And at that time, obviously, now the neoliberal academy in Italy asked me to rethink as quick as possible my research and to do it in the same time I was supposed to finish my PhD. And for me, it has been a time of like uh, quite depression. I went through a lot of panic attacks, and it's been through like the care network of my friends uh, that I went through that process. And it's, well, I will not reflect on this today, but that made me reflect a lot about how networks of care also behind academia is crucial in those process. And uh, so going back to 
to the topic of today, um, I will discuss. <laughs> uh, well, if any time you want to interrupt that somebody is not clear, feel free uh, to do that. So, I will talk about the case of Africa China Agriculture Federation as an example to explore uh, how we are observing the remaking of development geographies and the remaking of geopolitical power structure. And especially, I've been uh, thinking in my research of uh, the case of Africa and China agricultural cooperation to the date also, and as a case of representative of South South cooperation modalities practice and rhetoric. So we'll go in a little bit to, to discuss about what is South South cooperation. And then I will provide a short overview of Africa China agriculture relation. I will discuss the agriculture technology demonstration center. It's, it's the case that's been one of my Mean, let's say, a case study in Tanzania. Uh, and then my article is an article thesis. So, some of the observations I shared today it's some, are let's say, some of the links that emerge from, from this article. And I will conclude with this article. I recently, uh, it was the last article I wrote about how uh, to like this words analysis of, of China on agriculture during the last 20 years. Uh, so, uh, I think it's quite crucial to understand China discourse and China's debate about China's involvement in Africa and in African agriculture, also to situate what have been some of the academic debates in the last decades and how I've been situated my, uh, my research between like, critical geography and critical development studies. So, obviously, much of the interest of about China's presence in African agriculture emerged following this renewed geopolitical interest in African land and natural resources, so following the 2007-8 new land rush. However, at that time, there was a lot of debate about the role that new, let's say, actors were playing in this land grabbing and water grabbing process, and much of the attention was pointed out, especially about the role of China, but also at other BRICS countries. So I refer to Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And obviously, uh, the rise of, of those countries, particularly of China, they are obviously they are now major economic partner, but they are also leading part in the global aid architecture, and they are playing a role in reshaping the development of geography and also the reorientation of, of the world system. There's been a lot of debate about the rise of the South, the renaissance of the spirit of Bandung, and with that we refer to the Bandung conference that was held in Indonesia in 1955. So it was a specific moment in which 29 countries from Latin America, from Asia, uh, from Africa, they come together to condemn uh, colonialism. And from that conference, that it will preserve the non aligned movement in the 1970s. However, this rise of the South, and particularly in the case of China, is usually uh, used as a representative, has challenged the US hegemony and has opened this space of, of contestation. And we see it really clear this tension, this war between, like, this tension between China and the US, not just in terms of economics, like, uh, like war, but also in the space of development and cooperation. And so, uh, Another dynamics we are observing is what Emma Mosley, that is a human geographer, uh, and that has been dedicated about what the rise of the South and South South cooperation means for Northern actors or for traditional North South cooperation. And she's been called this process as the Southernization of development. So, in other terms, this convergence between practice and narratives between the global North and the global South. And obviously, all of those changing dynamic and geography of power have been shaped by multiple sociological, economic, and political crises. And during the time of my research, all of these have been obviously amplified by the speed of, of COVID 19. So, um, moving from that, I think I will just talk really shortly about uh, what I mean with South South cooperation and what is the, the role of global China uh, in South South cooperation? So uh, I, I don't think there is a unique definition of what South South cooperation is. And I put here a quote from Emma Mosley that actually uh, claimed that it's said that its capacious is variegated and it's flexible. And very broadly, it refers to the transfer and exchange of resource, technology, and knowledge 
set between the claims to share colonial and post colonial experience and identities. And I think uh, this point is quite crucial to understand how China official governmental discourse works today. Because if we hear a Xi Jinping discourse nowadays or any other official governmental discourse, China claims to share this uh, post colonial experience with, with the African countries. It claims that China never colonized Africa and they have this long friendship. So China legitimate and naturalized its presence through this course of friendship, of solidarity, of win win. And even if obviously those rhetoric are challenged by the ones, they are still crucial to understand how this relation is presented officially by the Chinese government. And another, uh, obviously, this narrative is anchored between a wider framework of promoting the collective spread and development of the global south. And another uh, aspect that I think is crucial, uh, I will not go in it about South South but I think uh, I wanted to point, to point out what are the South South cooperation principles according to the United Nations Actions and South South cooperation, because they resemble China's foreign principle in Africa and in other countries. And they are the respect for national sovereignty, national ownership, equality, no conditionality. And what one principle that has been added in the region, even in the last days, is the non interference in domestic affairs of other countries and mutual benefit. However, um, I think um, for our discussion, it's what I want to highlight is that South South cooperation emerged in a particular time that was following the Bantam Conference and with the objective as a counter narrative, as a counter hegemonic project to the West and to the North South cooperation. However, how many research has been arguing in the last year, over the time, South South cooperation is behind driven by technical and depoliticized agenda that's much more in line with traditional aid practice. And Alpha and Dutcher, for instance, have pointed out in a recent article, you reflect about the extent in which BRICS country can provide a space for a, a political space for African countries, an alternative space to the West. And he points out how one must what they are fought out against romanticizing the emergence of a powerful bloc referring to the BRICS country that speak with one voice representing the interests of African countries and development countries in general. So I think it's crucial to see how obviously uh, South, South cooperation emerged in specific historical period, but then the geopolitical and geodynamic ambition have radically changed in the last decades. Yeah, of course. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. There, microphone. Is there? Okay. Okay, let's go. Yeah, because there was a query in the office. It's okay. Maybe it's better like this. It's better like this. Yeah, I guess we can try it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, just really shortly, why in many cases, uh, China and Africa relations are used a representative to talk, to debate, to discuss South South cooperation and its changes? And obviously, on the one hand, it's because China's foreign aid and those principles uh, are resembled, like China's foreign aid in Africa is representative of those South South cooperation modality and practice. And this is books brought by really uh, good like Chinese academics where actually they talk about China's foreign aid and South South cooperation as representative of those practice. On the other end, obviously, uh, especially from a Western perspective, why many times the West, it seems so alarming about China's role in Africa. There is a lot of uh, especially negative position about the role that China is, is playing. And if we think in terms of number, obviously it's because China played both a prominent role between the BRICS countries in terms of GDP, but also is the main financial contributor to South-South cooperation. And at least, like this is a report that has been published by Kevin Gallagher, Gallagher where he actually claimed that China has become the world's largest development bank. And then the, the funds that is providing by China through the Exim Bank and the Development Bank are as much as the one of other international organizations. So it's quite clear also because there is much interest about, uh, about China. And yeah, I think in the last month, everyone has been heard about how the US and other countries are trying to stop China's uh, 
development in other countries, join its presence. Okay. Um, so what I've trying to do in my research is trying to explore how uh, this relation between the Chinese foreign aid and as a, an example of South, South cooperation through the case of agriculture relation and Africa-China agricultural cooperation. Um, just a few points that I think are crucial to this Africa-China relation before moving to the, the, the role of, of agriculture. Uh, I think one point that it, may, it repeatedly comes uh, and that I think like it's something that we need to, to go behind is the fact that Africa-China relations are far from being new and China's presence in agriculture did not erase following the 2007 and financial crisis because this has been the time in which internationally, especially mediatically, everyone looks at China in Africa. However, China presence is far from being new and there is a lot of study and it would hear some reference if you are interested in other aspects more than agriculture that cover renewable energy, the labor sector, and there's been a lot of research conducting. Uh, obviously, uh, from the mid 1950s when diplomatic relations starts until nowadays, China's geopolitical and geoeconomic ambition in Africa radically changed, especially from the 2000s. However, uh, agriculture has remained a priority in Africa and, and China. Uh, relation, as we will see like in, in the next slide. Uh, another point that I think uh, is crucial to situate this debate about Africa-China studies is the fact that there are different perspectives about the role and different interpretation about the role of China in Africa. And I put here three, let's say, dominant interpretation that appear uh, in, the, in the academic, in the like, academic literature. And one is that China is a new colonial power and this narrative is uh, sometimes much fueled also by, by the West, that China represents a non-Western partner and so an alternative to Western partner. And then the other interpretation is that China is in Africa is part of a global process of primitive accumulation and that works under the world system mechanism. Those polarized perspectives, they also reflect in the case of Chinese presence in African agriculture. So usually there are two different perspectives. One that argued that the experience of China's in the agricultural sector can be really useful for the development of the sector in African countries. And then there are negative views that, that argue that that agriculture experience is not relevant for the development of the sector in Africa. So what I've been one, my, one of my objectives since I start to be interesting uh, in this dynamic has been to overcome this polarized uh, perspective and going behind some of the dominant and persistent rhetoric and explore to like critical contextual analysis what was actually also happening uh, in the world. So, uh, however, I also was saying um, in my perspective, perspective, one of the crucial points to understand uh, Africa and China agriculture cooperation nowadays and contemporary engagement is to understand its evolution, is to have an historical perspective. And I think even more in the case of China, it's crucial to understand what's domestically and generally has been happening in China in the last year to understand how this has shaped its foreign policy and Africa is usually represented, some have been described as a terrain of, to, to, um, to test those foreign aid policies. So um, there are different periodization to, to talk about China and Africa agriculture cooperation. I use the one that has been provided by Liu Zhang. And so we see an initial period following the Bandung conference in which obviously China was in need of political recognition in the international arena and it needs the support of African countries. And if we think for instance that China's admission to the United Nations has been supported by African countries. And I reckon that, that, uh, that China still needs the geopolitical support of African countries nowadays in international forum. However, at that time, so China was supporting large state farms in Africa. So something that we are more uh, familiar with, so it was like providing large state farms in the forms of pureed, 
So China was providing the structure, the aid funds and, and everything. So it were like a complete uh, project. However, this shift and especially following the 1980s, and obviously if we think about what happened in China during that time, in the 97, the eight, Deng Xiaoping uh, announced the uh, open door policy. So it's the moment in which actually China opened into the world. And it's also the moment that um, you probably read uh, like that David, David Harvey in his book claimed as the start of neoliberalism with Chinese characteristic. And in this time, like China, the Chinese government is much more interested about its economic, its domestic development and start to formulate those narratives of mutual benefit so China is still nowadays claiming that it's the world is the largest developed countries and Africa is the development country with more countries. So that's as a developing country itself, China needs to, uh, to provide aid on a base of mutual benefit. And this rhetoric of mutual benefit uh, to combine aid and business, it becomes really clear in the new uh, millennium. So from the 2000 until the present, China has been launched different initiative, uh, for instance, the, the go out policy in the early 2000s, states policy that encouraged Chinese companies to invest abroad and African markets and agricultural sector have been one of the target of, this, of these policies. In the forum on China-Africa cooperation in 2006, China has been launched the Agricultural Technology Demonstration Center that I will discuss just in a bit. And they are quite representative of this aid plus business model that have been uh, debated, especially uh, from the West. And in my perspective, obviously, we are seeing how agriculture and food have been turning into geopolitical interest. And again, to a space of contestation also between China and the US in Africa. And I will not go through in details about the Belt and Road Initiative because that's another huge topic. Uh, but I just want to underline how also, obviously, China launched the Belt and Road Initiative. And there is uh, this recent article that I found really fascinating that, also, that argue how agriculture has been a less discussed um, sector between the Belt and Road. But one of the aim is also to construct agricultural infra infrastructure. And so the author argue how this can create a different global governance of, of agriculture and food production, and they name it as a new food silk road. Um, so um, I think this transition, uh, it gives us an idea of how uh, China's engagement in agriculture changed from providing this large scale project, how now is driven mainly by commercial and like business uh, interest combined with some element of, of aid. However, um, I will not go through today all the modalities and forms in which China engage or in which China uh, that's by, uh, driving uh, African-China agricultural cooperation, but I want to underline obviously how there is not a single China's model in agriculture in Africa, and there is a variety of actors involved of geopolitical ambition and geoeconomic interest, both from the African side and, and the Chinese one. So, um, I, I will discuss, um, like, as I say, there is not a single model, but I think the Agricultural Technology Demonstration Center in Africa are quite representative uh, how, on the ways in which China intervenes and uh, is transforming African rural space. So just really shortly, the Chinese Agriculture Technology Demonstration Center were launched during the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation in 2006 the Chinese government first announced 10 centers. Nowadays, there are more than 25 centers in different African countries. And in the last forum on China-Africa cooperation that was held in, in, in Senegal in 2021, actually China announced that it was going to develop more of those centers and to create new ones. Uh, this center attract international attention, both uh, in media attention and in the academia. Um, and the reason is because they are representative, they've been also denominated as the new business of development, and they combine this aid plus business model. So the idea of the Chinese government is that uh, agriculture uh, aid projects are economic unsustainable. 
Uh, and so they cannot just have this aid part, but they need also to be economically sustainable to have a business part that cover the other expense. And this also obviously reflect these win-win narratives because on the one hand, China is providing aid in the form of demonstration and training, obviously demonstration of Chinese techniques, of Chinese machinery, of Chinese technology. But on the other hand, this is beneficial. It's win for China because uh, through this platform, China is attempting to encourage Chinese companies to invest abroad in agriculture. However, the extent to which this win-win is uh, it's, it's actually taking place in the ground have been contested. It and um, and as we will see, I will show you what are some of of my observation in the case of of Tanzania. However, another aspect why the ATDC are, are interesting is because usually we hear a lot of Chinese state-led projects. So with this idea that China is acting as a monolithic actor with a unique interest in, in Africa, but obviously there is a variety of actors that are involved in, in this relation also in agriculture. And what is curious is that the ATDC are presented as the flagship project of China-Africa Agriculture Corporation at the governmental level. But what actually happened is that the daily management of the center is provided by provincial governments in the forms of private companies of in, like research institute and university. In this form that it's not um, much developed like in, in China of public-private partnership. So this also like I've been used as a case to discuss and go behind China state capitalism and seeing how there are different actors and interests involved. So um, I will not go in deep about uh, my like all uh, the case of, of the ITDC in the Kawa, but I put here the maps to have an idea of wh where that is located. So the Kawa is a small village that's located around 40 kilometers from Morogoro city in the region of Morogoro in Tanzania. Um, so just really shortly, what I've been point out, uh, reflecting on more globally on the ATDC and the model, and specifically on the case of Tanzania, is the fact that obviously ATDC can reproduce new forms of dependencies, both on Chinese capital and Chinese know-how, and Chinese agriculture inputs so machinery. Uh, in the case of Tanzania, the Chinese companies was attempting to introduce rice hybrid seeds. And as we know, hybrid seeds need to be bought every year. And obviously, this create a kind of dependency toward Chinese companies, as well as the need for fertilized and pesticides. Uh, another aspect that I think is crucial is that Technology transfer, techno like technological systems, is central in Africa-China relation, and also in the case of agriculture cooperation. However, obviously, as we know, China's like technology transfer is far from being purely neutral or technical, but include a certain vision of doing agriculture. And I will uh, tell you in the next slide what is the main vision that China is promoting in terms of which kind of development, agriculture development model is promoting in Africa. Uh, but obviously, China legitimate its presence through the South-South cooperation narratives of friendship and naturalize its presence because China is there to help Afri to fix Africa food security. But also, obviously, China's discourse depoliticize its own intervention because it presents China intervention as purely technical. Uh, Moreover, what I've been um, discussing through the case of the ATDC in Dakawa, and I've been like contributing to this debate that has been pointed out by Jan Taylor and Dean Zions behind others, to the fact that China uh, is an element of diversification of African development, uh, and it also represents, um, it creates this double dependency. So that means that uh, like, the, well, it no means that China is actually is uh, act totally different from what Western actors have been doing, but actually China is taking advantage of dependency relations that have been established traditional by Western countries, creating a, this diversification of development. So creating this double de de dependency both on China's and traditional Western countries. So, um, I think that uh, I don't want to like, give the idea that 
you know, like that's how a TDC, well, I've been arguing that a TDC foster, can foster and create new form of dependency. That not, doesn't mean that uh, African countries are receiving passively those centers. And I, I talk here about African agency. I will not go in details, but if you're interested about the topic, I put here a reference of, of, of an article that's been published in the last days. Uh, what they actually debate about different form of African state agency and the bargaining power that I have in relation with, with China. We, we can also debate that later if you're interested. So uh, Chiyemura and other colleagues actually um, point out how African agencies, the ability of Africans as individuals or collectives to shape their engagement with external actors in ways that subjectively seen as safeguarding and advancing actors' interests and objectives. And um, I think also in the case of RTDC, it's uh, like it's good to underline how usually African government are welcoming those, uh, the establishment of those RTDC and more in general China's uh, technology trust for agriculture. And this is like something that emerged from the RTDC in Uganda, Rwanda, is how uh, China's agricultural technology are uh, well except because it's affordable compared to Western ones and easy to adapt to African environments. And another thing that also happened and that I could notice in Tanzania is that obviously uh, the Tanzanian government itself create space for global investors to come and invest in agriculture modernization or in technology transfer as it's been happening with the Sagot corridors. So obviously uh, they this create this space, not just for China, but there is a lot of other global actors that are investing in agriculture. So uh, moving towards the, the, the end of my talk, um, what, what, I've been, what I've been dedicating my time, especially after I come back with Tanzania, from Tanzania, I decided not to continue to, um, to conduct distant field work or what has been nowadays called sometimes as digital field work. And this has been for a variety of reasons, um, mostly because uh, I, I didn't have either the funds or the possibility to have co-research or other. Uh, and in the field, I made some arrangement with local organization and movements that I was like uh, doing some like tra translation in English and they were helping me with Sahil. So I put up a set of network that I could not continue when I was back. And moreover, I didn't like, when the university, when I was back, the university told me like, you have to rethink as quick as possible. And I didn't know how the situation was going to evolve. If I was like putting person into the re to risk, if they have to go to the field. And so there was a lot of ethical consideration and I decided to conclude that my, my reflection and I, what I've done uh, in the last article has been to use discourse analysis as a quality methodologies to challenge feature of development discourse and to show how China's discourse obviously depends upon certain geopolitical context. So I've done this uh, wondering uh, with some question in my mind. First, which kind of agriculture, which kind of model of agriculture China is promoting in Africa? And if this narrative has been changing in the last year and how? And so I've done that using the official documents provided by the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation in the last 20 years, so from the 2000 to the 2018, uh, in an article that I co-write with my supervisor, Professor Paula Minoya. And then with the occasion of this talk, I also did revise the 2001 FOCA. So what have been uh, some of the main themes that emerged is that from the 2000s, China is promoting the modernization of agriculture through the use of technology and of Chinese technology in particular. However, this narrative uh, is continued from like the last uh, 20 years, but from 2015, and obviously if we think about in that time, the climate conference in Paris happened, there was global environmental concern about climate crisis and obviously also China's discourse need to adapt to those global concern. And so it's the time in which China starts to talk about the green development and also this green option in agriculture. And more lately in the last book, I also talk about organic and sustainable farming, but without providing any details about this will happen. And lastly, the last 
let's say, narratives is the, ban- is the one about the digitalization of agriculture and the setup of e-commerce platform. So uh, some of the, uh, the reflection that emerged from this discourse analysis, there are, those are some points. There is a long, longer like um, debate and discussion, but I think some of the main point is that uh, obviously China's discourse of agriculture modernis- narratives of modernization and technology, they reduce agriculture into a technical program that can be fixed uh, through the development of new technology or through the use of Chinese technology. And obviously, as we know, agriculture is a much more dynamic, complex space that and agriculture problems or food insecurity cannot be solved just through the use of new technology. And so this narrative has invisibilized the complexity of agriculture and the relation that agriculture has with other uh, dynamics like gender, like class, like inequality, like extractivism, like land grabbing, just to name something. And so obviously contributing to this depolitization of, of Chinese discourse. <laughs> Another aspect that I, th- I see as crucial is the fact that in all those documents, I never find a reference either to patients or to the role of women in agriculture or to farmers. And obviously, uh, this also put another question, who is benefiting from those agricultural initiatives? Who, who are the target? And then regarding these green development narratives that, or this green cooperation, I, uh, what I've been questioning is what kind of green uh, development China means. And because I think we are going through a co-optation of many terms like green, like food sovereignty, like agroecology that have been used by mainstream organization. But uh, so what I think will be crucial to the next year is to trace what actually green means and who is benefiting from those green initiatives, because apparently in the last Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Action Plan, there is a lot of um, consideration about the role of Chinese companies in investing in green initiatives, but like who are the other actors that are involved in this green development? And another aspect, uh, well, there is many much more that if you want to debate later, like, but I think another crucial point is that, again, those narratives are not uncontested, are not passively received by people. And there is African resistance movement, food sovereignty movement, and women movements that have been, uh, there is a lot of resistance, especially towards Chinese illegal mining activities and the environmental impact of extractivism and agroextractivism. And there is a lot of articles that have been uh, published about how those movements are not just claiming uh, and resisting Chinese presence, but they have been questioning the capital system as a whole. So uh, that will be the last two slides. I hope I didn't went too long. So I want to conclude with some final observation that emerged from my research and some points that for me are still like open question and I'm still engaging with them. Uh, also with those point, obviously. But I think uh, the case of Africa-China agriculture cooperation and China-Africa relation more broadly is representing how we are moving towards different or new geography of development and how, for instance, Emma Mosley and Tagger, just in an article that have been published like in the last months, they argue how we are moving the, towards these more hybrid forms between global actors and northern actors. And I think this is much true also in the case of agriculture. So if we think about uh, China's narrative of modernization, technologization, this is a digitalization, those narratives are not any new or different from the narratives that have been promoted by the Global North, by international organizations, and more recently, that have been brought to Africa by Philanthropy Capitalist Foundation under the label of the New Green Revolution, despite the fact that there is excellent work conducted in the last years that have been claiming how Agra is a failure and how it's impoverishing farmers and creating more dependency rather than providing those alternatives that they are debating. Another aspect that, again, is not new, Amanor and Chisava, they point out in 2006, that how behind those framing of diplomatic relation within South-South cooperation, and that's why I wanted to highlight at the really beginning what are these frame and which are those principles that are 
naturalize China's engagement in Africa. The underlying process of Chinese and Brazilian engagement, so they have been conducted comparative research in Africa, have many similar, so similarities with the accumulation imperative of agribusiness from elsewhere. So I think that, like I agree with some uh, claims that China-Africa relations are, are usually central to debate the future of development in African countries because they are providing a lot of funds infrastructure at the moment. But on the other hand, they are, they are not less asymmetrical than the new colonial relation produced by uh, imperialism. And so to conclude, uh, some of the reflection that emerged also as a, as a geographer is that obviously China had complexity and it make it clear that the special binary that have been used until now, so the North South, the developed, underdeveloped, they are outdated, they do not reflect the reality in the ground. But at the same time, and I agree with Jules Mon when he say that they poorly capture the current geography of power, because if we think about China, I say China is simultaneously south or north and neither. So on the one extent, I'm reflecting, uh, this is a, a noble reflection on how, how critical geographer, how uh, scholars we can, and how geography also can contribute. And if we need new or different special framing to understand the global rise of China and of other actors. Another question that I've been engaging a lot is uh, how like research that I've been like in exchanging with those South, South geographies is a question that Gonzalo Vincente point out in, in this book that's been actually engaging with epistemological uh, issue of, South, South, of researching South South development geography. And he, he asks, where is the South? Uh, and this is something that I've been also relating during my research because how we consider this out, because obviously the rise of China also had complexity, complexity to the very notion of the South. And what I've been arguing by, by Gonzalez is the fact, can we consider South China as we consider, for instance, Tanzania or other Southern actors? And do we, to this extent, I'm wondering uh, how uh, post-development the colonial approach can contribute to, to this discussion. And finally, and I think that uh, the consolidation of these new, that are not new because are really consolidated actors, that supposedly as Chinese always are saying they are providing alternatives to the West, they're providing alternatives kind of development. But again, I see much more similarity of what traditional donors have been done. And I think this move us urgently to rethink again, not simply about alternative development, but real alternatives to development. Thank you.